You're listening to episode 52 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Today's show features a new cookbook for teens, college students, and young adults. It's written by one of my favorite dietitian cookbook authors, Katie Morford. Katie's new book is called Prep. The Essential College Cookbook, Everything You Need to Get Started in the Kitchen. And I hope you're hungry because Katie joins me to answer your questions and to talk about some of my favorite recipes in the book, including butter lettuce with green goodness dressing, roasted broccoli with lemon and Parmesan cheese, and golden banana bread. And by the way, you will find that banana bread recipe over on the Liz's Healthy Table blog, So I hope you'll stop by and check it out. And while you're on the website, I hope you'll also head on over to lizeshealthytable.com slash podcast. Go over to the show notes from this episode number 52 and enter for a chance to win Katie's new cookbook. This is a US only giveaway, but we are giving away one copy to one lucky listener. So this book is for beginner cooks. But between you and me, even if you're a well-seasoned home cook, you'll love the recipes in the book. And I think you'll also love Katie's Kitchen Wisdom and all of her tips for recipe success. For beginner cooks, let's say you have a child graduating from high school or college, or you have a high school kid who's really eager to learn the basics of cooking to get into the kitchen more often, then this book is a must. In a nutshell, I would say that prep provides the foundation for a lifetime of cooking confidence. And of course, we want our kids to know how to cook because when they can cook, they can prepare fruits and vegetables and you know what? They end up eating a healthier diet. This is Katie's second time on the podcast. If you haven't listened to episode 42, which was all about winter squash, then be sure to tune into that show. So this is her second time on the podcast. It's kind of fun to start welcoming my guests back onto the show. We actually go way back, Katie and I. She and I, I think, met maybe 10 years ago, maybe more. I'm losing track of time. But, you know, we're both dietitians. We're both in the family nutrition space. And we're both cookbook authors. And besides writing prep, Katie has written a book called Rise and Shine, Better Breakfasts for Busy Mornings, and a book called Best Lunchbox Ever. And she also writes for magazines. She writes for Real Simple, Family Circle, Parents, the San Francisco Chronicle. She's written for the New York Times. And she's also the voice behind the popular food blog, Mom's Kitchen Handbook. And that website features recipes, nutrition advice, and weekly meal plans, all for busy families, momskitchenhandbook.com. She lives in San Francisco with her husband and her three daughters, so she knows her way around the kitchen. Now, before we get started, don't forget to join Liz's podcast, Posse. This is my closed group on Facebook. Anyone can join. It's a great community. That's where you get to ask questions, and then I get to include you on the podcast. If you're on lizeshealthytable.com slash podcast, you'll see a link to the podcast posse in the sidebar. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com, your one-stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. My show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. This is an app that is filled with parenting podcasts, including a show that I just discovered called Newbies. This is a podcast that guides new mothers through their baby's first year of life. Episodes feature newly postpartum moms as they celebrate the excitement of becoming new parents, as well as the emotional and physical struggles of recovering from childbirth and caring for a newborn baby. Check out the show and the podcast app over at parentsondemand.com. 
So if recipes like noodles with spicy peanut sauce, true blue smoothie, and mixed in the pan applesauce cake sound good to you, then you're going to love my interview with Katie Morford. Katie, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So I must tell everybody that Katie sent me an online, like a digital version of prep. And then like literally an hour ago, the book came in the mail. So I'm super excited to have the book with me. But before we talk about prep, Katie, just introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us, you know, who you are, where you work, where do you live, all that good stuff. Well, I'm a registered dietitian and a writer and a cookbook author, and I live in San Francisco. I work for myself, and I do a combination of cookbooks, some magazine work. I write a blog called Mom's Kitchen Handbook. I have three daughters who are range in age from 15 to 21, and Prep is my third book. I wrote a book about six years ago, I think it came out, called Best Lunchbox Ever, and then I wrote a book that came out three years ago called Rise and Shine. So you are quite the cook and you are a dietitian, but are you formally trained in culinary or are you just kind of self-taught? I, I mean, I was raised in a household where cooking was a big part of our family culture. My brother is a restaurant chef. I did not go to culinary school. I did work for a time at a restaurant in a kitchen, but it's really kind of, I was raised that way and just doing it a ton on my own. Mm -hmm. And you've got three daughters. And so you're cooking family meals all the time. And I guess you're yeah. just in the trenches, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just learn as you go. So I know we're going to talk about your book. But there's this question I get all the time from listeners and readers. And that is, you know, I walk in the door and I just don't have a plan and I don't know what to make for dinner. So like if you walk in the door, Katie, and you really have no plan, but just, you know, what's in your pantry, let's say, what would be kind of that ideal meal you would whip up for your family? Sort of that spur of the moment meal, a healthy meal, by the way, got to be healthy. So what would you make? You know, that's really honestly my favorite way to cook. Not that I like to cook under duress, but I love just opening my pantry, opening my fridge and seeing what I have and just sort of feeling inspired. So for example, last night, I didn't have a plan. I basically pulled out all the bits and bobs and vegetables I had, cut them all up, tossed them with olive oil, roasted like two sheet pans full. And then I turned some herbs into a little sauce that went on the side. But oftentimes that roasted vegetable thing is the foundation for a dinner because that can go on some cooked grains. It can go into tacos. You can make some eggs on the side with it. That tends to be my quick and dirty go-to. And I also think that is great for just reducing food waste because we all tend to have, you know, half a cauliflower, a little bit of broccoli. In fact, that's what I have a lot of veggies in my fridge right now. So I might just do that tonight. You could even do it with baby carrots, right? You might have half a bag left or something, right? Yeah. I mean, I had mushrooms. I had like a little chunk of celery root. I had some fennel. I had turnips. I had a sweet potato. And then I threw a can of beans on there at the end just to kind of warm them up with a little olive oil and lemon. Yum. Yeah, All right. It was good. Sounds yeah. good to me. All right. So you've got this new book. It's called Prep, the mm -hmm. Essential College Cookbook, Everything You Need to Get Started in the Kitchen. And my first question about the book is, you say it's for college kids, but you had sent me this online version of the book. I, which of course was like a file, it's not like everybody can get their hot little hands on it, but I've been cooking from it for several days now, and I feel like it's a good book for me, and I love to cook. So tell us about the book. Well, I mean, I really see it as a starter cookbook, so it could be for any age, and it's something that I wrote. The sort of seed of the book started when my oldest daughter was a senior in high school, and I was thinking about her being off on her own and really thinking about what are those skills that I want her to have for her lifetime as a cook. So it's not really like the book to learn how to make a pot of ramen. It's really the book mm -hmm. that builds a foundation for a lifetime of cooking. That's really sort of how I saw it. So it's those kinds of skills that you need for cooking. Why did you name the book Prep? I came up with that name right away. I thought it was just kind of cute and catchy, and it sort of has a double meaning. You know, there's food prep, of course, but I think of it as sort of like a preparatory school for cooking for teenagers and college students. So I just thought prep was catchy, and that's what it's been ever since. 
You know, there's so much emphasis these days on teaching little kids how to cook. I work for a program called Kids Cooking Green, and just yesterday I was with these cute little elementary school kids. But then we think about high school kids and college kids, and I think there's this gap there where a lot of them kind of missed the boat on learning how to cook. So they're going off to college, they're out on their own, and they don't have those basic skills. What are the benefits to having kids of all ages learn how to cook from scratch versus always having to rely on, say, the ramen noodles and things that are really processed and salty and, you know, not as good for you? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the first thing is that home cooked food is generally healthier than takeout or restaurant food. It tends to be lower in calories, lower in fat, lower in sodium, and all that kind of business. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it tends to be more economical. So particularly when you're talking about a young person, maybe they're in their first apartment, they're watching their pennies, knowing you know how you can take a bag of beans and a thing of rice and turn it into dinner is a really useful skill. And I think you know the environmental piece is something that really matters to these younger generations in particular. And when you think about all the takeout boxes and all the food waste that's associated with restaurant eating, because those portions tend to be so big, that's a factor as well. And then I think lastly, and just as important as anything else, is that I think home cooking can be really fun. And it's a great way to kind of gather with the people you care about. Yeah, it's really social. You know, I've always said to Josh, my older son, you know, if you learn how to do the dishes, that's like a huge win. If you learn how to cook, I mean, now we're talking. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I do feel like with Josh, my older son, I kind of failed because he just never was interested in cooking. He always has said, I'm going to be rich one day. I'm going to hire people to cook for me. I mean, what an attitude this kid has. I'm like, Josh, you need to learn how to cook. He can make an omelet. My younger yeah. one, Simon, he's much more skilled in the kitchen, I'd say. But that leads me to my next question, which is about knife skills, because I mm -hmm. get this question a lot. It seems to be something people are really interested in, like learning how to hold a knife, learning how to use a knife. But there's this fear factor of, oh, my gosh, my child will cut himself or herself. In the book, you talk about knife skills. You kind of talk people through how to cut an onion and how to chop up herbs and veggies and things like that. So how should people hold a knife? When should they introduce their kids to a knife? Should we be afraid of that? Well, I mean, it's like any aspect of parenting that's scary. You know, the first time they walk to the bus by themselves or the first time they get behind the wheel of a car. But at some point, we let them do it. And we're there with them to show them how. So I think you can give a three-year-old a butter knife and a soft banana and they can start their skill set. And then you can build from there. And I'm also seeing some really cool sort of starter knives out there for kids. I know there's a company called, I think it's Kai, K-A-I. They make these cool knives that are sort of shaped like a chef knife, but they have a little serrated edge. So it's one of those things you just kind of got to pull the Band-Aid off and, you know, start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it does feel scary, but, you know, a lot of parts of parenting are scary. This is true. I mean, yeah. just think how hard it is to learn to floss your teeth, right? I mean, <laughs> come on, there's a lot of hard things out there. So I got this question from Teresa. She's in the podcast mm -hmm. Posse. And she says her son lives in an off campus house at the mm -hmm. University of Rhode Island, which is my alma mater. And she says she'd love to know how to encourage her college age son to cook more and to find healthy recipes that appeal to his burrito-loving, burger and pizza-loving mind. So how would you get him off of those sort of typical college foods and expand his repertoire and maybe get him to cook a little bit? You know, I really thought carefully about the recipes that are in prep, and I do have things like burgers. I have a really simple pita bread pizza. I have a breakfast burrito. So it has those kinds of recipes, but... To me, learning how to do it homemade rather than takeout is that much better. And then you can build from there. So maybe he learns how to make a burger, but then he also learns how to make the sweet potato chips to go on the side that are also homemade. And I think the other thing is thinking about when he's home, let's say in the summer or on a break, maybe suggesting that they make a meal together or he participate in part of the meal. And in our house, I think a big incentive for my own kids learning to cook was that they never had to clean 
if they made a meal. So if they made breakfast for everybody, they were off the dishes duty. And that has always worked really well. And as a result, my kids, they all know how to cook. That is a great tip. I am telling you, my kids have done so many dishes in their lives. So next time they're both in my grasp, in my grip, I will encourage them to cook a little bit. I love that tip. So you had talked about knife skills, but there's other things you talk about in the book, other things that are good things to know. There's Mm -hmm. just a lot of a primer. So before we even get into the recipes, you're giving us all this wisdom. So what are some of those basic cooking terms, measurements, essential skills, equipment lists? Like what are some of the other things people can find at the beginning of the book? Well, one thing I talk about is just some little bits of wisdom that I've picked up along the way. For example, I learned this years ago when I used to work with Marian Cunningham, who was a cookbook author, and she just tasted the whole time she was cooking, every stage, every edition, so that by the time it was done, it was really seasoned. You don't want to get to a point where you've you know, been cooking something for a long time, and at the end, you're like, it's flat. I don't know where it went wrong. So tasting as you go and just tasting your food. Don't just make something and plunk it on the table. You want to know that when someone takes that first bite, it's going to be as you expect it to be. And I think also acknowledging that everybody makes mistakes. You know, my brother's a Michelin star chef, and he screws up too. So I think that's just acknowledging that and that you can go back at it again and don't give up. And then another mistake I've seen my girls do, and I do too at times, which is just double check your recipes. So before you stick that cake, you know, from the mixing bowl into the cake pans, look through your list of ingredients and make sure that yes, you did put in the baking powder or you didn't leave out the sugar. So those are a couple of little just kind of bits of wisdom. And then I think you know, knowing what it means to chop or whisk or beat. And those are all things that are in the book. I think that's really helpful. And what's kind of cool is that we live in the day and age of the internet. So any 17 year old doesn't know they can just do a quick Google search and see how to hold a knife or cut an onion. That's true. You can learn how to play the guitar by just going to YouTube. So yeah, exactly. (laughs) We can learn how to cook. I love that. You know, I was reading somewhere this week that adults under the age of 35, like more and more of them don't even own a can opener. I was looking on your list of essentials and thankfully Mm -hmm. you had a can opener. I mean, I feel like, oh my gosh, how could you not own a can opener? Because canned foods are so convenient, you know, and you could open up a can of beans or tuna or salmon and you've got like a whole meal. So you've got this list in the book of all these different essentials, you know, equipment essentials. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. I get this question from Sarah, on the posse. And she says she wanted to know what cooking essentials that she should send with her daughter off to college. She says she will be in a dorm. I guess she's going to be, you know, heading off to school in the fall. And she says, I'm thinking of a mini fridge and a microwave and a toaster. Seems like a lot. You know, these dorm rooms are really small. But if you're in a dorm room, what might you have in there? that could get you on your way. And then, of course, Sarah's worried about all those dirty dishes. And I'm just thinking about Simon up at the University of (laughs) Vermont. The last time I was up there, he's like, Mom, you can't come in the room. I'm like, why? Mom, you don't want to come in the room. So my sense is the dirty dishes are in the room. So what might be a few other things Sarah can send her daughter off to college with? Well, I think first off, she probably should find out what she's allowed to have, because I know a lot of dorm rooms have very strict rules around electrical appliances. I think, you know, fridge is usually fair game. And I think that's a great thing to have. Beyond that, she may not be able to have something, you know, that plugs in. I know my daughter had like a coffee maker and it was confiscated at college. But if she was allowed to have something, I think something like an electric kettle would be great because then you can make oatmeal and you can make hot soup and you can make tea and that kind of thing. And the other thing to find out is if maybe there's a communal kitchen and how that is equipped. Mm. You know, because sometimes dorms will have that, and that could be a place to go not only do some food prep, but also do some dishes. Because I don't think that a tiny dorm room is a great place to do dishes. It is not, because then you end up in the shared bathroom, and it's not a good scene. So, I mean, I think, you know, really thinking about her daughter in a dorm room, I would think more along the lines of having that mini fridge and then having more snacky things like a jar of nut butter, a loaf of bread, some whole grain crackers maybe some veggies and hummus, 
some fruit, cheese sticks, you know, those kinds of things that will tide her over if she doesn't get to the cafeteria or she's studying late into the night. And maybe she arms her with just a knife and a cutting board or something like that. Mm, yeah. And you mentioned those sort of dorm room snacks or, you know, say you're a young professional and you're sort of out in the world for the first time. Those snacks are so important because people, you know, when they think of snacking, they often think it's, you know, junk food in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. And the snacking can really be like a mini meal. I mean, it can be really healthy. And you do have yeah. snacks in the book, too, I've noticed. Yeah, I have a chapter called Snacks and Little Meals. And it's exactly that. And they're designed to be healthy. There's a recipe to make a really super simple guacamole. Anyone can do it. You could have that with vegetables or tortilla chips. I've got a blueberry smoothie in there. I think that's a great, super satisfying snack if you can get some protein into that. And I, you know, have a peanut butter toast and you layer all kinds of goodies on top. So that can be something satisfying and healthy. Mm. And, you know, it reminds me when Josh was at University of Delaware living off campus, I did send him this little mini blender. It's like a mm -hmm. maybe a two cup blender. And in the mornings, he was, to his credit, blending up a smoothie with uh, yogurt, juice, and banana. So at, yeah. le at least he was getting some good protein and good nourishment, and some fiber before he left the house in the morning, because I don't think he was really grabbing breakfast. So even something like that, you know, for Sarah, a little blender you can plug yes. in and then you've got yes. some bananas, some yogurt in the fridge and some milk or juice and you're good to go. Yeah. Those little ninja ones that, you know, it goes right into the cup and you can take it with you. Ooh, that's a good idea. Love that. Yeah. So you've got chapters. Let's see. Your book starts out with an egg chapter. I'm a huge mm -hmm. egg fan. You've got veggies and main dishes. You've got sweets. You've got this banana bread that I'm dying to make. And I went and bought four <laughs> bananas and they're ripening. And after I hang up with you, I actually might go make that. But tell us about some of the recipes in the book and just how you wrote the recipes because it's a little bit different from a typical cookbook. It's really descriptive. You've got an equipment list. You talk about safety. You give this pro tip on each recipe. So kind of walk us through what the recipes themselves look and feel like. Well, I mean, you know, the format, there's 10 chapters. Each chapter has five recipes. And the idea was, if you can tackle a couple of these recipes, for example, the pasta chapter. If you can tackle one of those recipes or two of those recipes, then you can build on that and make other pastas. So that was the idea. You know, I live with three young people, teenage and college students. So I just kept them in mind as I was writing these recipes and thinking about a true beginner and trying to give them, you know, I don't just say set the heat to high. I say, put the pan mm -hmm. on the heat you know, turn it to high, you know, that level of detail, because my goal was that anyone who's a young person could pick this book up and have success and not feel, you know, disappointed or set back by the fact that they failed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was kind of my thinking. And, you know, the chapters just try to cover the whole gamut, uh, how to build a salad, how to cook a piece of chicken, you know, how to cook a vegetable that you actually want to eat, um, all those kinds of things. And it really is important to know how to use a knife, because I think that opens up your world to fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can slice mm -hmm. an apple, if you yeah. can cut up, you know, a head of broccoli, then, you know, you're one step closer to being successful. So if you had all your kids in one room and your husband and you, mm -hmm. you know, you're all in the room <laughs> at the same time, you bring out prep. Mm -hmm. And you say, all right, everybody, what's your favorite recipe? Am I going to get five different answers? Or is there like a family favorite in the book? You're probably going to get a combination of those two. I mean, there's definitely things in this book that they've grown up on and that they all love. But you know, they're all different. And two of my kids are vegetarian. So obviously, they would gravitate towards some of the vegetarian recipes. You know, the mac and cheese is super popular in our house. There's a mix in the pan applesauce cake that they all absolutely love. They love that banana bread you mentioned. And, you know, the salad recipe, are, those are all the dressings and salads that they grew up on. So I think that's also a really popular one. Mm -hmm. You do have a recipe in the book for this. I was calling it in my mind a green goddess, but it's green goodness. So it's mm -hmm. this green goodness. I'm just opening up the book now. There it is. Butter lettuce with green goodness dressing. And I love butter lettuce because it's so delicate. It's just like mm -hmm. this lovely lettuce. And I started making it. I have a mini food processor. 
Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, no, 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 no. You need your bigger, <laughs> like, get rid of that. Get your bigger food processor out. You could make this in a blender, but I was hoping you could just kind of talk us through this recipe for butter lettuce with green goodness dressing. And I've been using this sauce, not just for salad, but I've been putting this on everything because I'm in love with avocados and this has half an avocado. So can you talk us through, tell us what's in your green goodness dressing? So that is a really popular dressing in our house. And it also can double as a dip. And I think it's exactly the kind of thing that can be a wonderful way to incentivize young people to eat vegetables because it's so delicious. And it's a green goddess, but rather than relying entirely on mayonnaise and sour cream, a lot of the creaminess comes from using ripe avocado. And that's also what makes its color even more vibrant and makes it healthier because you've got those good healthy fats and fiber in there. So it's avocado, there's green onion in there, basil, some lemon juice and olive oil, and then there's sour cream and mayo. And it just all gets thrown in the blender, comes out really creamy and tangy and super yummy. Now I used, instead of sour cream, because I Mm -hmm. always have Greek low fat or reduced fat yogurt in my fridge, the plain, and it was delicious. So can you sub out the sour cream for the Greek yogurt? Absolutely. Absolutely. You could even you know, probably up the avocado and use less of the mayonnaise. I mean, it's definitely a recipe you could play around with. You could use cilantro instead of basil. Mm. You could use basil and mint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really versatile. You know, if you use a blender instead of a food processor, what's your tip? Do you have a hack for getting all the dressing out of the bottom of that blender? I don't. I mean, I feel like this is a design flaw of a blender and someone needs to get on it. But, you know, sometimes I might add a tiny extra liquid at the very end and try to get every last drop. But I do find it kind of frustrating. Mm -hmm. So we need an invention. We need to go on Shark Tank. And this is how we will make our millions. Absolutely. All right. If anybody listening wants to join us in this new and improved blender design, please email me immediately. (laughs) And we will go on Shark Tank. I am one degree of separation from Mark Cuban. I'm I not, do. I Are you? I am. Oh. My friend Suzanne, who's coming over this afternoon to go for a walk with me, her brother is really tight with Mark Cuban. All right. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm ta- yeah, this is really good to know. But I do have a tip on washing blenders, which you well, may already thank know. thank you. Thank you. We need that immediately. What is it? I just empty it out with whatever you've made. Fill it like halfway up with warm water, a squeeze of soap, put it back on and let it run. And it really, it's not going to get, obviously get completely clean, but it helps, makes it much easier to clean once you do that. Very good. All right. For that, I give you a million (laughs) dollars. Thank you very much. So GJ, another podcast posse member, she Mm -hmm. says, this is a question for you, Katie. What are some quick and easy meals a law student can make after a long day at school? Her son has a crock pot. So recipes where you can dump in the ingredients with no pre-cooking required. That is what she's looking for. What do you got for us? Well, I do have some slow cooker recipes on my blog, but I will tell you that I don't have a ton of experience with those sort of, you know, dump and go crock pot meals other than doing like a jar of salsa verde and some boneless, skinless chicken thighs and letting that go on low. I think that works really well and you can shred it and then turn that into tacos. But I will say that, you know, for someone like that, who's really busy and probably coming home exhausted, I would say just investing a tiny bit of time on the weekend to either stock the house with something, things that can really quickly be turned into meals like canned beans, you know, cook a pot of rice, have some eggs and tortillas on hand, have some pre-washed leafy greens. All of those things can quickly make a meal. And then maybe also on a Sunday is when you make that crock pot soup or curry, and then you have it that you can, you know, eat it for a couple of nights. Or maybe you make a big batch and you freeze half of it. Mm. You know, those are some of the things that I might do. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I have a recipe on my blog. It is pulled pork, but you could mm-hmm. do this with chicken. Chicken thighs, by the way, work really well. They're so moist, yeah. but the boneless, yeah. skinless. But I just do pork loin yeah. and I add barbecue sauce, like an all natural barbecue sauce. I add some shredded carrot, some diced onion, and a little bit of diced bell pepper. And then I just let that go for like eight hours on low and I shred it up. And so it's similar, you know, where you're yeah. just adding like your protein, your sauce, and then I throw yeah. in some veggies because it, 
all sort of disappears. Yeah. And then, like you said, you could have it in tacos, you could have it over rice, you could add it to a salad, you could freeze leftovers. So I think her son would definitely benefit from something like that. Yeah. And I love that you're adding all those veggies in there. I mean, I do that with like pasta sauce. I'll, you know, dice up really tiny, a bunch of goodies so that mm -hmm. you're really enriching it. Yeah. And you know, I'm a huge veggie lover. And Tim and I were just on vacation. We were out in Aspen. We were skiing for mm -hmm. a week. I did not ski every day. I'm not a great skier, but I did my best. It was really fun. But I said, listen, we've been eating out a ton. We got to like detox when we get home. My idea of a detox is just to eat all a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so your recipe in the book for roasted broccoli with lemon mm -hmm. and Parmesan seriously yummy. So I've been eating that for several days. Yeah. And I did cheat on that, Katie. I didn't buy a head of broccoli. I was at Trader Joe's and I just bought like two bags of the broccoli florets. That's a great sort of shortcut. You know, for a kid, that's a great thing too. You mm -hmm. know, they can still make it without having to bother with the cutting. It's still delicious and healthy. Yeah. And, you know, like even for Josh, you know, in New York, like if you mm -hmm. live in a big city, you have a Trader Joe's, you get the yeah. florets. And basically all you do with this recipe is you toss those florets with extra virgin olive oil. You add kosher salt, black pepper, and then you roast it at 425 and mm -hmm. on a baking sheet. And then you give this great recommendation to sort of toss it about, you know, two thirds of the way through. Because sometimes, you know, things will start to brown a little bit too much on the bottom. You want to kind of have it bake evenly. And then what you do at the end, and this is what I love and I don't typically do, is you call for squeezing lemon juice over the broccoli and then mm -hmm. tossing with Parmesan cheese, grated parm. Yeah. Oh, my God, that lemon. It just makes it so vibrant. Yeah. Love that. I mean, this, I do this with cauliflower, too. And if I leave that out, like if I pull this out and leave it out, my kids will gobble the whole sheet pan up. It's, mm -hmm. it's really good stuff. Yeah. I mean, we want vegetables to taste good, right? So yeah, that's yeah. a great technique. I think you could do that. What else might you do that with? So you've got broccoli, cauliflower, something like carrots, sweet potatoes even? Yeah. I mean, I would do it. Yeah. Sweet potatoes would be good. I mean, any roasting vegetable. Fennel would be nice. That's really nice with the lemon. Mm. Turnips, anything that you would roast, I think would work. Love, love, love. Why is it important though for everybody to know how to prep vegetables? Because I think I mean, the baby carrots are great, right? I mean, you could open up a bag, buy some hummus, dip away. But getting to kind of that next level, why do you think that's so important for all of our kids, you know, high school on up? I mean, I think it's important for everybody, for kids and grownups. And I think if you know how to prepare something, whether it's cutting something or roasting something or steaming something, you're that much more likely to cook it. And I think the first step is really knowing how to cut it. And I've seen this in adult cooking classes I've taught where they look at a bell pepper and they don't know how to get in there <laughs> or how to cut an onion that isn't going to take you, you know, 20 minutes. A couple little skills around that stuff can make all the difference. So I think, and you can build on it like we were talking about earlier. If you show a teenager how to cut a cucumber and they get comfortable with that, then maybe they'll be cutting celery and cutting carrots and or if you teach them how to roast this broccoli, then they can roast cauliflower or, you know, zucchini or what else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes on and on. So your books come out, it is the springtime. I think of college kids and I'm thinking of the fall. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend people get the book now so when their kiddos get home in May from college, they can spend the next few months prepping them to go back to school to be better cooks? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we decided to come out with the book in the spring because we were thinking about graduation. We were thinking about eighth graders graduating, so entering high school, high school students graduating, entering college, college students graduating, entering real life, and thinking that this would be a great gift idea in all of those groups. And I think ideally, this is a book that starts with, you know, younger teenagers. So they have those years at home to have their mom and dad buy them groceries and help them with knife skills and pitch in with the cleanup and all that kind of stuff. But definitely a kid coming home from college, having this book and taking the summer to pick up a few tips and techniques, I think is perfect. 
I love it. Well, I love the book and I'm super excited you came on the show. And just before we kind of wrap it up, I'm curious if you have a personal favorite. And I realize that changes with the season. So what in the book kind of speaks to you right now the most? Oh my gosh, that is such a hard question. You know what? There's a recipe that was kind of made on the fly. Um, It's in a chapter called How to Feed Your Friends. And I have a lot of real classics in here. There's a baked mac and cheese. There's a chili. There's some meatballs. But I wanted to have a vegetarian recipe in here because I know more and more kids are going vegetarian and two of my kids are vegetarian. So I made this Thai style coconut curry noodle soup that again has those Asian flavors. It's, I think, a pretty easy recipe to make. It sounds kind of exotic, but technique wise, it's pretty easy and it's absolutely delicious. So that's yeah. the favorite. I saw that as I was flipping through and I was curious, could you use the light coconut milk or? Yes. Okay. So either or is fine. Absolutely. Yeah. When I make that at home, I would typically use the light coconut milk. Okay. There's also, I think I mentioned this recipe earlier, but there's this mix in the pan applesauce mm. cake I'm really crazy about. And I think it's, you know, I grew up making these dump cakes where you mm-hmm. take a pan and you just dump all the ingredients in, mix it with a fork, bake it. And it's just a really tender, delicious cake. And then you can frost it if you want. That's super fun. Now, Mm -hmm. you do not give nutrition information in the book. And I'm curious, you're a dietitian. Yeah. I'm curious why you made that decision. Well, you know, I made the decision not to include nutrition information. And I also made the decision not to do things like call for whole grain flours and things that I might normally do that I do on my blog that I do in my other cookbooks, because I just wanted this to be as easy and accessible for any young person. And I didn't want, you know, a 16 year old to look at my chocolate chip cookie recipe and go like, yuck, almond flour and whole wheat flour. I just want them to learn to make a delicious cookie. And I think you can build from there because the rest of the book also has lots of really healthy stuff. It's a balance. So I didn't want it to come off as remotely clinical. I just wanted it to all be really delicious. So if you get the foundation, so you learn Mm -hmm. how to make the applesauce cake, let's say, and then you're like, okay, I can take half of that all-purpose flour and substitute it with whole wheat. Why not? I'll give it a try. Absolutely. Or you can make a really wholesome dinner. There's like a roast chicken dinner in there. And then you can make the applesauce cake. And that's a perfectly reasonable, healthy meal that's a lot better than something that's going to come, you know, from the takeout guy. Mm -hmm. And then wash it down with a glass of milk. Exactly. Get some good calcium. Why not? Yeah. Well, I love the philosophy. And I'm wondering if any of your three girls is Mm -hmm. destined to be a Michelin star chef one day. Is, Is it in their stars? I don't know. They are all really different kinds of cooks. And they're all very capable. My oldest daughter is a junior in college, and she's studying abroad, living in a house with like 10 other people. And she's been cooking these big, elaborate dinners for everybody. And part of me is wondering like, huh, wonder what, you know, where this is going to go, or is this just fun? So it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. But that's nice and social. And I'm sure everybody now wants to be her roommate because she's (laughs) cooking for everybody. Yeah. It's like that whole Friendsgiving thing, right? Where, yeah. you know, the millennials, you know, the singles, they all get together. I used to do a Friendsgiving when I lived in Atlanta a zillion years ago. I worked at CNN back in the day and wasn't home with my parents. I always had to work through Thanksgiving and we used to host a whole Friendsgiving. It was so much fun. Yeah, it's fun. Got to get those skills. Well, Katie, I cannot thank you enough for treating me to this cookbook and for coming on the show a second time. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is always fun to talk to you. And before I let you off the hook, Katie, I know the book is literally like hot off the press, but what's next for you? Are you going to write a fourth cookbook or is this like a ridiculous question? I don't, it feels a little too soon. I really enjoyed doing all of my books. So who knows, maybe I'll do another one, but I feel like I just need a little breather for a moment. So enjoy promoting the book, right? And again, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm hoping our listeners learned a lot and I encourage everybody to check out the book. So thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to talk to you. 
And a reminder to all my listeners that we are doing a giveaway. One lucky U.S. winner will win Prep, the essential college cookbook. But again, this is good for everybody. So head on over to Liz'sHealthyTable.com slash podcast. And then you can enter for a chance to win on the show notes from this episode. If you love the show, post a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Share it with a friend. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.